So thank you very much. So first of all, I'd like to also thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. And I'll talk about the techniques that we've been developing for in Frederick Merck's group at the ETH in Zurich to manipulate the translational motion of atoms and molecules excited to Rydberg states. And in particular, I'll show you how we use these techniques to decelerate Rydberg atoms and molecules from supersonic beams and load them into electrostatic traps. So to give you an overview, first I'll give you a brief motivation as to why we're interested in producing cold samples of Rydberg atoms and molecules in this way that we do. And then I'll talk about this Rydberg Stark deceleration technique that, we, that we're working on. And then I'll, I'll show you this three-dimensional electrostatic trap that we've developed for these Rydberg atoms and molecules. And I'll demonstrate this trap with the, with the deceleration trapping of hydrogen Rydberg atoms. And then I'll go on to talk about the challenges associated with decelerating molecules using these techniques and how we've managed to work around these challenges and be able to recently, very recently trap uh, hydrogen Rydberg molecules. So there, the initial motivation for all of this work was to try to uh, produce slow beams of Rydberg atoms and molecules for use in high resolution spectroscopy experiments. And these are experiments where the interaction time of the Rydberg sample with a narrow bandwidth microwave or millimeter wave field was the limiting factor in the resolution that we could achieve. So the kind of experiments where we do are double resonance experiments where we excite to a low Rydberg state with a single vacuum ultraviolet photon. In this example here, in Krypton at n equals 77. And then we would drive a microwave or millimeter wave transition to a higher Rydberg state. And here, maybe I can do this refresh. Sure. Or ha or refresh. Was it this? Was it this? Was it this? Uh, was it this uh? Oh, strip. I'll leave it as is. Was this one? Or? Yeah, this I tried already. Ah, okay, sure. Yeah. Okay, sorry. That's it's already very fresh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and here then the resolution, it's not limited by the lifetime of the lower state or by the bandwidth of the millimeter wave field, but it's limited by the interaction time between the atoms and the field. So these kind of measurements are important in studying the role of nuclear spin in photoionization dynamics. And for example, it's studying uh, um, auto or hyperfine autoionization, possibly in, for example, krypton atoms. And it's also an important step in determining the ionization potential of atoms and molecules, and in particular, there it's a, an important step in determining the ionization uh, potential of H2 or HD or D2. And then, from a chemistry perspective, we're, look, look, we're interested in using these techniques to look at the many body interactions between these samples that we excite. And these would be state changing interactions due to dipole dipole interactions and things of this nature. And then, also from a chemistry perspective, we're in, in using. In, uh, interested in using these techniques to control the collision energy of these Rydberg species with ground state molecular samples. And these are then uh, behave in a, in a similar way to ion molecule reactions. And finally, from a quantum information processing perspective, we have now some links with the, the group of Andreas Valraff in the physics department at ETH. And he works with these superconducting microwave uh, cavities. So these are chip-based cavities of these superconducting wires. And this is a cavity here, a microwave cavity. And he then puts some transmon qubits about this, uh, located about this cavity. And we'd like to explore now the possibilities of using these Rydberg manipulation techniques to locate some Rydberg atoms at particular positions in this cavity and to try to look at coupling between the cavity uh, and the Rydberg samples. And I should also say that there's a sort of general, um, broader uh, motivation, which is to try to use these te techniques in a general way to produce cold, slow samples uh, of, m of molecules which can't be laser cooled or decelerated by alternative means. So these ideas of Rydberg Stark deceleration then go back to proposals around 1980 by Breeden and Metcalf and by William Wing. So Breeden and Metcalf realized the Rydberg atoms exhibit these very large electric dipole moments, suggesting that inhomogeneous fields can exert forces on them. And they say then that these forces, with very small fields, these forces could be very large. And also William Wing around the same time realized that you could very easily, with very small electric fields, produce uh, traps with depths on the order of ambient uh, KT uh, for these Rydberg states. And so the idea then is to, oops, to selectively excite a Rydberg Stark state with a particular electric dipole moment and then uh, apply an inhomogeneous electric field to exert a force on this. So in this example here, this is a, a set of Stark states of atomic hydrogen. In this example here, we would selectively excite this outer blue shifted Stark state. And when an atom in this state then moves into a strong electric field, its internal energy increases and it slows down as it moves into the field. And correspondingly, we could excite this redshifted state, which would, would, would accelerate into also into the strong field. So here, then, the potential energy is equal to the Stark energy. And then the force that we apply is just the gradient of this, uh, this, this potential. And in the hydrogen atom case, then, we're not limited by effects at these, at these crossings here between adjacent Rydberg states beyond the English tail limit. 
And the limiting field that we can apply then is the ionization field in doing this deceleration. So you can also then look at this as the manipulation of the dipole here. So if you plot the electron charge distribution in a plane containing the electric field axis for this outer blue shifted state, you can see the ion core is sitting at the middle here, and all of the electron charge is really on one side of the ion core. And that's where these states get these very large dipole moments from. And the states then that we're interested in are around n equals 30, where the dipole moments on the, are on the order of 3,000 d by. So uh, three orders of magnitude larger than typical polar molecules in the ground state. So following these proposals around 1980, it took a bit longer until experiments were done. And these first experiments then were done in Tim Softley's group five or six years ago in Oxford. They showed some deceleration of hydrogen molecules. And these are an N equals 16 and an N equals 17 Stark manifold here. And they were first able to show some deflection in a time-independent inhomogeneous electric field. So they could see then that the states on this side of the manifold, so the, the red shifted Stark state, were pushed one way when they looked at where the, ion, where the uh, molecules hit the microchannel plate detector. And the blue shifted states then were pushed the other way, and equivalently for the N equals 17 manifold. And they were also able then to show a small amount of deceleration uh, for these beams where they could show that the extreme red shifted states and the extreme blue shifted states arrived at different times uh, following a, a, a flight path of about 20 centimeters to the microchannel plate detector. Then following this in Zurich, now we've done, uh, tried to develop these techniques further using time-dependent in inhomogeneous fields. And with these, then we've been able to decelerate argon atoms and decelerate and trap hydrogen atoms. So the source for all of these experiments is a pulsed supersonic beam. And so this gives us a high density and in pulse, gas pulses that are typically between 10 and 50 microseconds long. And the, the mean velocity of the beams are somewhere between 500 and 1,000 meters per second. And they have temperatures, translational or relative translational temperatures on the order of one Kelvin. And the rotational temperature equilibrates with the translational temperature. So the rotational temperature is also on the order of one Kelvin. And the vibrational temperature is a little bit higher. And so after this skimmer, then we do our experiments where we try to maintain the high density of these beams as we load them into an electrostatic trap. So the scheme of the experiment looks like this. This is the first experiment I'll show you where we decelerate and trap atomic hydrogen in this three-dimensional electrostatic trap. So our, our source is this mixture of ammonia and argon. So this is the beam that we get out of this pulse valve. And then we photolyze the ammonia to make, uh, make hydrogen atoms. So we have the, uh, this excimer laser here that focuses into a quartz capillary mounted on the exit of the valve. And there we, we can photolyze the ammonia to produce NH2 and H. And then it's these hydrogen atoms that we then selectively excite later after the skimmer. So as the beam travels through the skimmer into this set of electrodes, we have then uh, two laser beams crossing in here. One is at 121 nanometers to drive the transition from the ground state to the 2p state. And then the other is at about 360 nanometers to go from the 2p state to Rydberg states around n equals 30. And then we always detect by, uh, by pulsed field ionization. We pulse the ions then down to this microchannel plate detector, which has a phosphor screen behind it, so we can image where the ions hit the detector. So to give you a close-up of the trap then that we've developed, so this is a six-electrode trap, and it's also the decelerator, as I'll show in the next slides. And so the, the gas beam propagates from left to right through here, and the excitation lasers then propagate in these directions here. So these four electrodes, one, two, three, and four, we set them to potentials of plus and minus 20 volts from a uh, forming a quadrupole field. So the minimum of the field is then in between the four electrodes. And then we close off the trap in the, in the extra dimension with these uh, split electrodes in, in, at each end here. So when these are at zero volts, they produce a high field region at the ends of the trap at, at both ends. Or we can then apply some potential to these to lift the minimum of the trap from zero volts to if we apply, in this case, plus and minus 55 volts, we can get a minimum of the trap that goes to nine volts per centimeter to avoid uh, effects of uh, Majorana type transitions at the minimum of the trap. So then with these small potentials, we get a trap that has a saddle point at 64 volts per centimeter. And for these n equals 30 states that we excite, the trap is about 3 Kelvin deep. OK, so the, the scheme then, so this, as I mentioned, is also the decelerator. So what we do then is with the, these electrodes set up in this trapping configuration, we have in between these first two electrodes then a reasonably homogeneous electric field. And when the atoms are in this region between these electrodes, then we pulse our excitation lasers and we excite the Stark states that we're interested in decelerating and trapping. And so that, that happens in, in that case. So then the next step is then the deceleration phase, which is just about, you can see the second uh, part of this sequence here. And for that, then we pulse these high potentials on electrodes three and four. So this produces this very high field in front of the atoms and it will slow down the blue shifted states as they move into this strong field. However, if we left this field on, either the atoms, if they were slow enough, would move up this hill and then um, uh, be reflected and move back down the hill. 
or if they were going too fast, they would just move up this hill and, and see a field then that would ionize them. So we let these potentials exponentially decay with a one of read time of about two microseconds. And they decay then back to the quadrupole configuration. So if we get the timing right, then we can decelerate this bunch and load them into the trap while these potentials then decay back to their original uh, values. And the final step then is, is this pulse field ionization. So for do, to do that, then we pulse these high positive potentials on electrodes one and two. And this produces a high field region in between the four electrodes where we can field ionize any atoms or molecules that are trapped in this region. We push the ions then down to the microchannel plate detector on the right-hand side. So if we do this for atomic hydrogen around n equals 30, so we excite the outer Starks, blue shifted Stark states here, we can see that we load the trap initially here. So when, when we start then the black dots are the experimental trace. So this is the number of ions that we detect as a function of time after the excitation. So the excitation happens at zero time, and then we start detecting ion, uh, the atoms that are in the trap following this. And I should say first that if we don't do any deceleration, the beam which has an initial velocity of 700 meters per second will fly through this trapping region, which is only three millimeters big, um, in about five or six microseconds. So after this time, we wouldn't see anything in the trap or in this region. So if we decelerate, then we see, for, see particles in this region after this time. And when we load the trap, we see them then even up to 600 microseconds after this time. So initially, there's some fast decay from the trap. And then there's a single exponential decay, which corresponds very well to the expected lifetime that we would expect for these states of around 135 microseconds. And just to demonstrate that they're really trapped, we can switch off the trap, in this case, after 40 microseconds. And we see a very fast loss of atoms within 25 microseconds from the trap volume. And I should say, at this point, then, there's a log scale here. And in the beginning, we have around about a million atoms in the trap. So then we wanted to also confirm that we were really trapping in three dimensions. And we wanted to do this by trying to see some oscillations in the trap. So in this case here, then we set up the trap so that in this one of these uh, dimensions in the plane perpendicular to the beam propagation axis, we loaded the atoms very high up on the walls of the trap. So they had very more potential energy in this direction than they do kinetic energy. And then we'd expect that after some time, they would fall down into the middle of the trap and focus in the middle and then go through an oscillation. And this is what we see then in these ion images. So at early times, after 35 microseconds, the ion cloud really fills the microchannel plate detector. This is the, the curved edge here is the edge of the microchannel plate detector. And after 65 microseconds, the ions have really focused down to a spot right in the middle of the detector. And then they go through this oscillation. And this detection is quite signal intensive. So after this time here, we don't see such a strong signal anymore. And we can simulate this process. So this is a simulation of the propagation of the neutral particles as they're decelerated and loaded into the trap. And then a simulation of the ion trajectories from the trap volume uh, down to the microchannel plate detector. And this is, reproduces reasonably well then uh, what we see in the experiment. And so if we work back then from this simulation, we can get some estimate of the density in the trap. So here, this, these ions cover a, a range of four centimeters across on the microchannel plate detector. But back in the trap then, uh, initially the, the cloud is about one centimeter long in this direction. So this is just from a simulation that we do. And then after this 65 microseconds where they focus down in the trap, they're then in a volume of about one millimeter cubed and there they have a density of about 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 8 per cubic centimeter. And that's then of these states which have these very large permanent dipole moments of about 3,000 dBi. And finally, then, we wanted to try to measure the temperature of the cloud in this trap. And then to do this, then, we've used techniques that were mentioned in two talks ago, um, where we look at these ion time of flight distributions as they arrive at the microchannel plate detector. So here, after some time, so in this case 50 microseconds, we switch off the trap. And then we pulse the ionization. And when we ionize immediately, the ions have a narrow time of flight distribution as they arrive on the MCP detector. However, if we wait and the cloud expands before we do the ionization, so after the trap is switched off, then the ion time of flight distribution also expands as it arrives at the microchannel plate detector. And if we do some calibration, then we can work out how this expansion of the ion time of flight distribution corresponds to a, a spatial expansion of the cloud of atoms in the trap. And we see then a linear increase in, in, the, in the radius of this cloud. So this is. Uh, we're ionizing at different times up to about eight microseconds after switching off the trap. And this linear increase then corresponds to a, a radial expansion of about 50 meters per second of the cloud. And that corresponds for these hydrogen atoms to a temperature of about 150 millikelvin. And this is the kind of temperature that we would expect from the, from the velocity distributions of the beam that we load into the trap initially. So just to give you a little overview of this part of the talk, so I've shown you that we can control the three-dimensional velocity distributions of these clouds of Rydberg atoms. And for these hydrogen atoms, I've shown that we can decelerate them from 700 meters per second to zero. And we can do this in a distance of three millimeters. And it takes about six microseconds. And this is an adiabatic process. And it's also phase stable. So we don't tend to heat the bunch 
as we load it into the trap. And this, these then numbers then correspond to acceleration on the order of 10 to the 8 meters per second squared. And finally, then the trapping times that we've measured here, they're limited by the radiative decay of the states that we excite back to the ground state. So if we want to then extend these techniques to apply them to decelerating molecules in rhythmic states, there are two problems that we come encounter. So the first is that now we have a non-hydrogenic core. So there are some, for low L states, there are reasonable size quantum defects. And these give rise then to avoid crossings at the English Taylor limit. So this is the S state in the molecular hydrogen here around N equals 22. And these are M equals zero states. And this, this state then joins the Stark manifold and leads, gives rise to then these avoided crossings here. So we can use this range of field to decelerate uh, a molecule excited at this state. But once we get to this point here, the molecule loses its dipole moment and we can't decelerate it anymore in a higher field. And the other problem is that low angular momentum states tend to not live very long, uh, or at least molecular uh, Rydberg states. So they tend to pre-dissociate. And then they live for only a couple of hundred nanoseconds. So both of these problems we can overcome in, in, the same, it, or in the same process by increasing L in the excitation scheme. So the avoid the crossing issue, so this is just a, a zoom in of this region here uh, for M equals zero state. So this is N equals 22 and N equals 23. And these are then the outer Stark states here where they have these very large avoided crossings on the order of uh, one or two gigahertz. However, if we can increase, uh, so we increase M, in this case we make M equals three, so we've used F Rydberg states. And there now, the avoided crossings become really small. So they're on the order, uh, so they're less than 10 megahertz, or around about a megahertz. And that's sufficiently small then that we can go through them diabatically in our deceleration process. So if we excite this blue shift this state and we go through this crossing here, we can ensure, ensure that we remain always in this low field seeking state. So that's, that solves this problem of, um, of the quantum defects or the effects of, of these avoided crossings here. And it also sh uh, solves the short lifetime problem due to predissociation. So these F Rydberg states tend not to predissociate so fast, and they live almost as long as we would expect for uh, atomic hydrogen Rydberg states. So to produce these states, then we do a three photon excitation scheme. So we go from the ground, so we do this in para H2. So the ground state is a J equals zero state. And we have a first photon at 106 nanometers, which is circularly polarized. And then we drive a transition then from this J equals zero ground state to this J equals one state in the B state. So this corresponds to the 1S2P transition in atomic hydrogen. And so then the second photon goes from this J equals one state in the B state to the J equals two state in the I state. So that's at 550 nanometers, and the light is also circularly polarized. And that corresponds to the 2P to 3D transition. And then we finally go from the I state to these Rydberg states of F character, so they're J equals three Rydberg states, uh, correspond or converging to an ion core with no rotation. So the, this is the adiabatic ionization limit up here. And so the important thing in this excitation process is do we make sure that all of the angular momentum of the photon at each step goes into the orbital angular momentum of the Rydberg electron, and we don't put any of this angular momentum into the rotation of the ion core. And in this process, we can also, so this photon is also circularly polarized, and we also see then these uh, states converging to an n plus equals 2 ion core and an n plus equals 4 ion core. But the ones that we're particularly interested in are, are these longer-lived ones converging an ion, to an ion core with n plus equals 0. So to do this experiment then, so th that was sort of with this excitation scheme, if we don't apply a field, then we produce an M equals three Rydberg state with uh, defined with respect to the laser axis. So when we turn on an electric field, we want to make sure that this M equals three Rydberg state is still an M equals three Rydberg state when defined with, the or with respect to the electric field axis. So to do that, we then need to make sure that our laser beams propagate parallel to the electric field axis. So the excitation region is in between these first two electrodes. So then we propagate the laser beams through a small hole in these electrodes, so it's about a one and a half millimeter hole that we get the beams through. And this makes sure then that the M equals three that we produce in the excitation scheme is what we require for the experiment. So here, the only modifications are we don't have to produce the molecular hydrogen. So we have a, a mixture of molecular hydrogen and krypton to produce a beam that starts off with an initial velocity of about 500 meter per second. And the rest is then as it was in the other experiment, apart from this uh, excitation geometry. So just to give you an overview then of, of then this kind of stark map of the region that we excite, so this is a matrix diagonalization of this region. So the black uh, manifolds here are the, man are the Rydberg states converging to this n plus equals zero ion course. So this is the n equals 22, 23, 24, and 25 states. And then the red ones are converting to an ion core with n plus equals two. So this is n equals 16, 17, 18, and 19. And in this region that we're interested in, there's also one state converting to the ion core with n plus equals four. And so it's quite a short-lived state that we see. So to initially look at, we're interested in this n equals 22 manifold, as we can go a little bit above the English Taylor limit and not worry about interactions with these higher n plus series. And so if we then do an experiment looking at this state, so this is a, 
a scan where we just scan over this field free Rydberg line and we detect more or less immediately. So for us, three microseconds is more or less immediately. And so this is just a, a field free scan over this line with no deceleration. And then we can turn on a field. So we apply some potentials to these electrodes that form the quadrupole of the trap. And we also detect immediately and we can then see this partially resolved stark states of this n equals 22 manifold. And then if we apply these deceleration pulses and load the trap, so again, I should point out that if we don't decelerate, then we can only see these particles for about eight or nine microseconds in this case. So when we pulse the deceleration and we measure after 50 microseconds, we're really only measuring things that are loaded into the trap. And we can see here, then if we scan the laser, that we only see these outer blue shifted stark states loaded into the trap. And these are the low field seeking states that we would expect to decelerate and, and, and load into the trap. And so this is the first check that we can, we can, and in principle we can then sit on one of these states and then load a single well-defined stark state into the trap in, in, in this way. And just to show you then the range of states that we can get into the trap with the same uh, potentials applied, so this is a scan over this full range that I showed in that stark map before. So this is also detection immediately after excitation in zero field. And so the, the lines that I've shaded in then are lines converting to this ion core with n plus equals two, and the other ones are the n plus equals zero series, so they're the ones that we're interested in. And then we apply a field, and we first of all we detect immediately, so as in the first case, and we can see then, so this is with smaller potentials, we can see these stark manifolds that are broadened and not resolved here. And we can also then, rather than pulsing the field ionization, we can let the molecules fly directly to the microchannel plate detector, and this takes 90 microseconds. And this gives us an idea of which states are long-lived and which states are not so long-lived. And here you can see then that, for example here, all of these states that I've shaded in blue, which are converging to this ion core with rotation tend to are, are quite short-lived and don't reach the, the microchannel plate detector in this time of 90 microseconds. So this spectrum here then gives us an idea of the states that we should be able to load into the trap and see after a reasonable time. And then when we do this trap loading, so we do the, we pulse the deceleration potentials and now we detect again after 50 microseconds in the trap and we can see here then that only the blue shifted states of each of these stark manifolds are loaded into the trap. And this is then with fixed potentials. So we've optimized the potentials for around n equals 30. And still there are states with a dipole of the right size then down to n equals 21 and up to n equals 35 or 40 that are suitable to be loaded into the trap in this way. So I just also want to point out at this point that to, I mentioned previously about the phase stability of this trap loading. And I can show you here, so this is a, a phase-based diagram. So this is the position along the longitudinal axis and the velocity along the longitudinal axis. So this is the bunch that we initially excite. So they have a mean velocity of 500 meters per second, and they have a spread of about 50 or 80 meters per second. And that's what we start with. And then as we do the deceleration, you can see we can really keep this bunch together very well. And when they're loaded into the trap, they haven't increased much uh, in or the volume they take up in phase space is not that much more than it was in the beginning. So we can really uh, not heat up this bunch as we load them into the trap. And in this case with the molecular hydrogen, we can load about also about 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6 molecules into the trap. We have initial density of about 10 to the 7 per cubic centimeter. And so finally, I just want to like to mention uh, about the decay of this trap. So here we, we load the molecules again, this number, and if we have high stagnation pressure on our, on our valve, so we have quite a high density in the beginning, we can see this quite fast exponential decay of the molecules from the trap. So this is again measuring the total ion signal, the total H2 plus ion signal from the trap volume. And this then has a one hour free time of only 20 microseconds. However, if we, if we reduce the stagnation pressure, so we reduce the density uh, of molecules that we're loading into the trap, so we also reduce the signal intensity. But here then we have a, a much longer one hour free time of about 40 microseconds. And this seems to scale then with the pressure, so it scales with the density of the states, of the number of states that we excite. So it seems then that our, currently we're doing some calculations, but it seems to us that we're, we're suffering here from uh, uh, state changing due to dipole-dipole interactions at these high densities that we initially load into the trap, but we still have to do some work on it. So to conclude then, I've shown you how we prepare these non-penetrating Rydberg states of H2. We do this with this three-photon excitation scheme, where we take care to make sure that the photons are circularly polarized. And I've shown you how we can tra trap then in three dimensions these homonuclear diatomic molecules. So these are, like Tim and Fahou mentioned, they're also polar molecules which are also homonuclear. And then uh, I've shown you then, so these translationally called molecules, so they're in a selector, or they can be in a selected quantum state if we sit on one of these lines and they have these large permanent electric dipole moments. We trap them at temperatures on the order of 150 millikelvin and these densities are about 10 to the 7 per cubic centimeter. And so finally, to give you some outlook, currently now we're interested, so we, we see these losses as we load the trap, which are, are, are losses that are not, are much, so at a rate that's much shorter than the lifetimes that we expect of the states that we excite. 
So we're now building a trap where we can, or building a decelerator where we can move the beam off the axis of the gas beam and, and load the trap then off axis. So we won't be affected by some of these collision problems with the, re with the undecelerated part of the gas bus. So that's what we're currently doing to try to overcome these problems of losses. And then we'll try to aim to measure the real predissociation or the real lifetimes of these stark states that we excite. And then also we think there are strong effects of these dipole-dipole interactions, so we're looking now also into calculating these effects. And then the future prospects are, as I mentioned a little bit in the beginning, to try to look, now we're building a new experiment to look at the possibility of using these techniques to manipulate single atoms or bunches of atoms close to one of these superconducting, chip-based superconducting microwave cavities. And we're doing this together with Andreas Valorov in the physics department. And we're also in the scheme of trying to uh, develop these general techniques to produce cold samples of molecules. We're also, also interested in trying to overlap one of these Rydberg electric traps with a magnetic trap for the ground state and then trap the molecules or atoms as they decay of the ground state if they're, if they're radicals. And so this is something also that's a combination of moving the beam off axis and, and trying to load this trap. And the anti-hydrogen community are also interested in these techniques to try to manipulate the anti-hydrogen that's produced in Rydberg states and we have some small amount of involvement in this a uh, newly approved anti-hydrogen experiment which is aiming at uh, measuring the acceleration due to gravity for antimatter. And so with that then I'd like to thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for this nice talk with wonderful results. There are other questions in this talk? I have a question. Yes, please. Um, can you go back a couple of slides? There was Right, uh, go back forward, I guess. Mm -hmm. When you are doing the, the trap lifetime, yeah. so the, the 40 microseconds was what, about three times faster than atomic hydrogen? Yeah. And can you say again, why, what, what's your thinking of why it's, it's so much faster? So we think it's, so it seems to be a den an effect, it's strongly affected by the density. So here we have a much higher density of H2 than we do a, of hydrogen in trap. So what's the density? So it's around about this 10 to the 7 per cubic centimeter. That's what we start off with. Okay. okay. And we expect then, so and, it, and because right. it's dependent on the pressure then here, and it sort of scales as it should with the pressure, or as it, with the density, so, then we expect that it seems to be some effect of these dipoles interacting with, with each other in a way that's, that causes state changing. So it's something that we're starting to, we're trying to calculate a little bit just using matrix diagonalization mm -hmm. to see if, it's, if, if this is if the cause. But it's much shorter. I mean, we would expect... So the atomic hydrogen, so these are a mixture of S and D states that we excite in atomic hydrogen, and they live for this 135 microseconds. And so they can decay into the P state. But these then, can, in atomic hydrogen, would be equivalent to decaying from this F Rydberg state to a, only to a D, to the 3D state, or back to this I state. And this should take place on a time scale of milliseconds, if it was just fluorescence back to this state. So it's either a predissociation that we didn't expect in these low, or higher L states, or it's an effect of, of something that's happening in the trap. So it's, it's, we're trying to look into both of these processes. There seems to be an oscillation on both graphs with, uh, with the same yeah, so oscillation frequency. Yeah, so when we load the trap, there, there can be some small oscillations. So when we, we, don't, we sort of optimize, we can pick one stark state that we load into the trap that loads best. But it doesn't, sometimes, or if N is high enough, we can load it right into the middle of the trap, and it, it doesn't move. And if, 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 say, we have low N states that we load into the trap, some of the states then, we can stop them a little bit past the middle, and they do a small yeah. oscillation on a very... So, so this could be what this is. The uh, I can't tell you here. So this is, it's something we can measure directly, but I, I, I don't know in this case. Yes. When, when, you're, when you showed that your N plus is two states, Disappear more quickly than n plus is zero in this polarization. That there, yeah. But is that something to do with the fact that the low L states don't exist for mj is three and, and n plus exactly. is zero, as whereas they do exist for yeah. So this is yeah. So we so when so yeah. So when we prepare these mj equals three states for the n plus equals zero, then the lowest L is g is is an f state. So then we only when we turn on the fields, we only mix higher L states. But yeah, in this case where n plus equals two, then we can also mix in the D state, which pre-associates quite fast. And this is an effect of this, you know. Yeah. 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 I think I missed your field distribution a little bit, but do you get to, do you have to worry about stark precession and things? Is the field always in one direction? I mean, what, what happens if this changes around and you're precessing the Yeah, so it's not at all in, in the same. So there are two times when things change. So 
The first is when we do the initial pulse, the initial deceleration pulse. So at this point here, so if the field, say, is acting in, in this direction here between the electrodes where we do the excitation, when we pulse the deceleration pulse, which the field then is acting in the other direction from these electrodes, and we actually adiabatically uh, rotate the molecules around so they're onto this uh, axis, which is in the opposite direction, when we start to do the deceleration. But this seems to happen adiabatically, and we never lose, and we also never see states so we never see, say, redshifted states that are loaded into the trap, which you would expect if this wasn't adiabatic. And yet, then the other thing, when they're in the trap, then you know, here the field distribution changes all the way around as you go around the trap. So, but this, the, the molecules are, or atoms are moving really quite slowly here, so this always seems to be an adiabatic process. And we don't tend to see losses there or, or effects that we would expect uh, from these kind of changes. And also, I mean, we have this, with, with these electro configuration, we can apply this field to lift the minimum from zero but we never, we've seen small effects maybe of having this zero field minimum, so small sort of Majorana type transitions at the minimum, but we don't see very strong effects at these temperatures that we're at now. There's no further questions. Okay, so thanks again.